In 1978, Micron began operations in the basement of a dentist's office in Boise, Idaho. They specialized in manufacturing random access memory components. By 1985, the company had expanded its operations, opening plants and refining manufacturing facilities. In 1995, Micron began construction on a large manufacturing facility in Lehigh, Utah. It was designed to be the most advanced manufacturing plant in the United States. But by 1996, Micron decided to postpone building the Lehigh plant and construction stopped. Micron's decision both to start and stop construction of their facility in Lehigh are examples of long-run decision-making. The interesting point with regard to Micron, however, is how quickly the market can change, fostering growth in one moment and stunting growth in another. As market conditions change, new firms are better able to adapt than older firms. The proprietors of the older firms become set in their ways or leave their business to those who have enthusiasm for business. Firms evolve over time, reacting to changing technology, prices, consumer tastes, and government policy. In the United States, many firms start up each year, and the failure rate for new firms is high. Overall, about 1% of all firms got of business each year. How economists explain and model the dynamic nature of business is in this segment of economics. It's time once again for Smart Guy, Dumb Guy. How long is a long time? What? A long time. Um, I don't know, a, a decade? <laughs> cool, I got it. Got what? I'm trying to figure out this long run, short run thing. So I guess a short run would be five years. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, it, it's not a time thing. What do you mean it's not a time thing? It's a definition, okay? Uh, okay, let's say you own a company. <laughs> As if you'll even get a job. But anyway, in the short run, at least one factor is fixed. In the long run, everything is variable. Oh, I kind of remember that. It's hazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe you own a toxic waste dump. Thanks. Okay. Anyway, you want more waste. Okay, so let's say you hire more workers, but you only have 50 acres of land. So that's the short run. Labor is your variable input, and land is your fixed input. And in the long run? In the long run, you buy up more land. So then that becomes variable. How long does that take? Well, I don't know. You own the dump. <laughs> okay, but whatever it is, that defines short and long run. But if, uh, but uh, say you need a lot of permits and stuff, you know, it could go on for decades. So the short run could last a long, long time. No. <laughs> I just dump it somewhere else, like North Carolina. I bet you would. Our goal in this program is to model the ways businesses decide to start up, shut down, expand, or contract. We've previously studied short-run production and output decisions. Recall that in the short run, two conditions are present. One, the firm is operating with a fixed factor of production, and two, firms neither enter or exit the industry. In the long run, these constraints are relaxed. So there are no fixed scales of production, and firms can enter in search of profits or exit the industry in reaction to losses. It's a good idea to remember that we'll be talking about economic profit and not accounting profit. So from this perspective, when a firm is breaking even, it's earning a normal rate of profit. When a firm is losing money, profits are below normal. In this situation, investors will not be happy and will not be attracted to the industry. If profits are higher than normal, investors are attracted, and we would expect an expansion of firms in the industry. 
The primary determinant that explains the dynamic behavior of entry and exit in the long run is cost. In fact, a thorough analysis of a firm's cost structure reveals almost everything we'll need to know about the firm. Also, costs can generally tell us about how an industry will evolve, whether or not there will be a lot of small companies or just a few giants that dominate sales. Well, let's begin with a review of profit, revenue, and cost, and show how they're measured graphically in a competitive industry. As an example, let's think about a hypothetical firm, say a pizza shop. Costs are either fixed or variable. Fixed costs include any payments that do not vary with the number of pizzas the shop sells. Examples include normal returns to any investors, rental payments, advertising costs, or a phone line. Variable costs include wage payments to employees and the cost of ingredients we use in making pizzas. Total costs are the sum of fixed costs plus variable costs, or the equation we see here, total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost. Well, let's say we can make 700 pizzas per week, and each pizza sells for $5. Here's a table that shows the relevant information for one week. In this example, our pizza company is doing quite well with an economic profit of $500 per week. Revenues more than cover both fixed and variable costs. We'll shortly show that positive profits are incentives in the long run for existing firms to expand and for new firms to enter. We can show this information graphically also. In the diagram on the left, we've drawn the industry supply and demand curves which determine how much pizzas will sell for. The competitive firm takes this price as given and is plotted as the horizontal line at $5 on the graph at the right. This is the firm's average revenue curve, and it's also the marginal revenue curve. Also on the graph, we've plotted the firm's average total cost curve, the average variable cost curve, and the marginal cost curve. From the average curves, we can derive the total amounts. For example, average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. So total cost is quantity times average total cost. Total cost is measured by the area of the blue rectangle, average total cost times Q. Similarly, total revenue is average revenue times Q. The difference between total revenue and total cost is profit. Well, some firms may not be as lucky as our pizza shop and may lose money or have negative profits. Losing money just means that costs exceed revenues. There are two possibilities. One is that revenues are large enough to cover variable costs of production, but not large enough to cover the fixed costs. In the short run, for these kinds of firms, it's wise to continue operating. At least in this situation, since revenues exceed variable costs, the difference, called net operating revenue, can be used to offset fixed costs. The other situation happens when revenues are so low that a firm can't even meet its variable costs of production. In this event, it's best for the firm just to shut down and pay its fixed costs until it can exit the industry or wait until revenues increase. Well, let's look at a simplified numerical example based on the pizza shop. This time, we'll lower the price of pizzas to $3. A table shows the relevant information for one week. Our shop is losing $900 per week. But if it shuts down, it would still be obligated to pay the $1,500 in fixed costs. What happens if the price continues to fall, say to $2 per pizza? Now, the price is so low, revenues don't cover the $1,500 in variable costs, so the loss minimizing strategy is to shut down. Graphically, the shutdown point is a price that is at the minimum of the firm's average variable cost curve. When prices are above this, net operating revenue is positive. Below this point, net operating revenue is negative, so the firm should shut down. It's time once again for Smart Guy, Dumb Guy. Whoa, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that after someone spends all that money, they should just walk away and lose all that money? That's exactly what I mean. Look, in, in order to make money, you've got to learn how to lose it. <laughs> I hate losing money. Oh, really? 
Look, but you've got to do it. Otherwise, you could lose even more. I don't get it. All right. Uh, let me explain. Okay, say before you even open your snowboard shop, you spend $100,000 on various expenses. Okay, uh, rent, business license, advertising, yeah, phones. I know. Professor Dude just explained that to me. That's my FC, fixed cost. Right, that's cost that I must pay before. That's right. And then you've got other expenses. Oh, yeah, I know, man. Uh, uh, VC, variable costs, costs. Uh, cost that, uh, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> that vary with the output. R right, yeah. Uh, the expenses that I have to pay to my workers. Hey, that's a variable, uh, that's a variable factor of production. <laughs> you know, cool. <laughs> okay. Now, what are we trying to do again? Make as much money as I can. Right, what, and that maximize profits. And what's the flip side of that? Losses. Man, I don't like losses. Yeah. All right, look, let's return to your shop, okay? Okay, you've got $100,000 in fixed costs, okay, and $50,000 in variable costs. But say you're only making $120,000 in revenue. Oh, man, this sucks. I'm losing 30 grand. I'm getting out. No, but look, but if you get out now, you're going to be losing 100000 Okay? By staying in business, you're losing money, but at least you can pay your operating expenses, you can cover variable costs, and $70,000 of your fixed costs. Yeah, but I'm losing money. Yes, you're losing money, but, but you're losing less money than if you get out now. Okay? Stay in business a while, maybe things will turn around. Oh, all right, okay, I got gotcha. you. Uh, I'm losing money, but, but I'm losing less money by staying in business than, than if I shut down. So do I always produce if I'm losing money? No. Okay. Uh, this time, let's assume that your revenue falls to 40000 Okay? In this case, you don't even have enough revenue to cover your daily expenses. You can't even pay your work workers without dipping into your savings or borrowing from the bank. Okay? In this case, you're losing 100000 in fixed costs plus an additional 10000 loss for having to cover your variable costs. Okay? That's a total loss of $110,000. But... If you shut down, you only lose $100,000 in fixed costs. I got it. If your revenue covers your variable costs and part of your fixed costs stay in business, at least for the moment, but if your revenue doesn't cover your variable costs and none of your fixed costs shut down. Right. Okay, one more thing. Don't let your sunk costs influence your decision. Okay, if you don't, you'll just be throwing good money after bad. I mean, let bygones be bygones and cut your losses. Oh, hey, man, I'm out of here. Wait a minute, where are you going? I'm not done yet. I gotta cut my losses. Recall that the firm maximizes profits by producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So a firm's short-run supply curve is the portion of its marginal cost curve that's above the minimum average variable cost. It looks like this. In competitive industries, we arrive at the industry supply curve by simply summing firm supply curves. For example, let's say our industry is comprised of three firms. When the price is $2, firm 1 maximizes profits by producing two units. Firm 2 produces three units, and firm 3 produces one unit. So our industry supply is 2 plus 3 plus 1 is 6 at $2. At a price of $3, Firm 1 produces 4, Firm 2, 4, and Firm 3, 2. So the industry supply is 4 plus 4 plus 2, which is equal to 10, at a price of $3. In the short run, the industry supply curve can shift if anything shifts the marginal cost curves of the firms, such as changes in input prices. In the long run, an increase in the number of firms shifts the industry supply curve. If firms enter the industry, the supply curve moves to the right. If firms leave, the curve will shift to the left. The dynamics of industry behavior is explained in terms of profit potential. In the long run, firms can adjust their scale of operations to find favorable ways to minimize average cost. A useful way to think about this is in terms of economies of scale. When a business doubles all of its inputs, which means changing its scale of operations, output can more than double, exactly double, or less than double. If more than double, 
then the firm is experiencing increasing returns to scale. This is sometimes referred to as economies of scale. In this case, average cost of production declines. The reasons for this include increased specialization and division of labor, technological improvements, and large fixed costs. Computer chips, for example, are characterized by large fixed costs spent in research and development. The marginal cost of producing one more chip is insignificant, so more chip production, the lower the average cost. On the other hand, if output less than doubles, the firm is realizing decreasing returns to scale or diseconomies of scale. Average cost would be increasing. Finally, when output exactly matches the change, there's a constant return to scale and average cost doesn't change. These relationships can be graphed by plotting a sequence of short-run average cost curves. In this graph, we see different scales of operations. At first, as we expand output from zero to 400,000 computer chips, we find that average costs decline from $2.20 per computer chip, producing 100,000 to $1 per chip producing 400,000. The different short-run average cost curves indicate different plant sizes. The fact that average costs fall as output expands indicates economies of scale. But as we produce more than 400,000 chips, even if we build bigger plants, average total costs rise, indicating diseconomies of scale. The envelope of these curves shows that the lowest average cost of operations is called the long-run average cost curve. It traces out the positions of all possible short-run cost curves. Its slope relates to economies of scale, and the minimum represents the most efficient scale of operations. Technology is one of the primary reasons why businesses can realize efficiencies of scale. Standardized production techniques were initiated in this country in the early part of this century in automobile production. Another source of efficiency is size. Very large companies can take advantage of volume discounts, bulk purchasing, and can produce their own inputs. The most often cited reasons for diseconomies of scale is inefficiency related to bureaucratic management. When businesses become top-heavy with high-paid senior executives, cost escalate. Information flow can slow down and there's a greater risk that communication can break down when there are more layers in an organization. Individual incentives can be washed out and managers may tend to spend more time on employee relations than on production. Even giant firms such as IBM can become vulnerable to aggressive rivals. The downsizing of such giants in recent years supports the idea that large firms have grown beyond their most efficient size. The dynamic of adjustment over time relates to profit and the flow of capital. When firms in an industry are enjoying economic profits, there are internal incentives for firms to expand their scale of operations and for businesses to enter the industry. Both factors tend to shift the industry supply curve outward, which puts downward pressure on prices. Well, how long will this go on? Well, until prices have fallen to the point that economic profits no longer exist. When prices are too low, profits are negative and there are incentives for firms to contract or to shut down until prices rise. So the long-run equilibrium condition under perfect competition is the price must equal the short-run marginal cost, which equals the short-run average cost, which is equal to the long-run average cost. Only under these conditions will profits be zero. Now, it's important to remember that this refers, again, to economic profits and not to accounting profits. Given this background, we can now describe the long-run competitive industry supply curve and how industries adapt to change. And now it's time for Chalk Talk with your host, Miss Sarah. Now we're going to look at an industry's long-run supply curve. Initially, we start with our standard supply and demand diagram and our equilibrium prices and quantity. And we 
Assume now that something has happened to shift the demand curve out. Something has increased the demand for this good. So we've got a new demand curve, and we have a new equilibrium price and quantity. The equilibrium price is much higher than it was before. As a result, the firms in this industry are making a profit. What's going to happen is, as these firms make profit, other firms will want to enter this industry, which will have the effect of shifting the supply curve outward. Now the equilibrium price and quantity is here. If we connect these points and all other points that might happen as that shifts, we get a long run industry supply curve that looks like this. We'll begin in equilibrium and show what happens when demand increases and find out how firms respond. Our original price is shown in this diagram at P1. With an increase in demand, we have a shift in the demand curve, which tends to increase the price to P2. Now, firms are enjoying excess profits. As firms enter, the supply curve shifts to the right, and that tends to lower the price. An important question is, how far will the short-run supply curve shift? If the industry is a decreasing cost industry, where there are external economies, costs will decline as supply increases, so the new price will be lower than the original price. The long-run industry supply curve is found by connecting the two point in equilibrium. In doing so, we find that the long-run industry supply curve actually has a negative slope. Well, why does this happen? Because the industry expands, input prices fall, causing the short-run average cost curve to shift downward. The fall in price may, in fact, cause the individual firm to reduce its output, even though the output for the industry has risen owing to more firms. But why do input prices fall? Well, let's take an example. Computer manufacturers, for instance, come into the Salt Lake City area. Workers desiring to enter the computer industry take it upon themselves to acquire an education. Workers looking for jobs assume the costs of training, at least in part, thereby reducing training costs to the firm. Both Brigham Young University and the University of Utah, in fact, plan to expand their engineering programs, thereby subsidizing Micron's expansion. If, however, the industry exhibits increasing costs with external economies, the long-run supply curve will slope upwards. Well, why is that? Because as the industry expands, input prices are bid upward. This is indicated by a shift upward in the firm's average total cost curve. This time, when we connect the two equilibrium points, we find that the long-run industry supply curve slopes upward. Let's take another example. The shortage of labor in Salt Lake means that as the service sector expands, demand for semi-skilled labor rises. The beginning wage rate for working at Wendy's, for example, is now over $7, far above the minimum wage. The result, the wage rates increase, shifting average total costs upward. Well, what does this mean about the industry supply curve? As the industry expands, demand shifts further than shifts in supply, so prices over time increase. Since the industry supply curve is derived by connecting the short-run equilibrium points, we find that the industry supply curve is upward sloping. In the first program, we talked about efficient markets. The logic is that profit opportunities are quickly eliminated as firms respond to changing market conditions. In practice, the entry and exit of firms in response to profitable opportunities usually involves decisions in the capital market. If an industry is doing well, investors pour money into the industry in various ways. We see it all around us, from software to specialty beverages. But if industries go out of favor, investors are just as quick to yank resources so output contracts. These changes initially happen in the primary markets, but cascade through to the resource markets. So what starts as a shift in consumer preferences winds up as a shift in resource demand. If the demand for wine goes up, 
that eventually translates to an increase in the demand for productive land that's suitable for growing grapes. We've explored what's behind firm supply and demand curves in competitive output markets. Now it's time to investigate competitive input markets.